Hello. Um, uh, today uh, we'll talk um, uh, about uh, uh, this uh, quite, uh, quite, imp quite important architect from um, Catalonia, from Barcelona, Carme Pinos. Uh, I think it is his birthday, uh, her birthday today, sorry, um, the, uh, the 23rd of uh, uh, June. I say I think because on Wikipedia this is not mentioned, but I have other sources of information that that claim that she was born indeed uh, on uh, on on June uh, uh, June twenty third. But on Wikipedia, Wikipedia we find this um, this text. Carme Pinos, born in nineteen fifty four, is a Spanish architect. Interestingly, it's not said uh, it is a Catalan architect. Pinos graduated Escuela Tecnica Superior de Arquitectura de Barcelona in 1979 and returned to the school in 1981 to study urbanism. From 1982 on, she formed a partnership with her husband, Enric Miraes, which ended in 1991. So they worked together for nine years and they produced some very important works. And Enric Miraes was a uh, uh, quite a good architect, to say the least. During this period, the projects developed include the Igualada Cemetery Park, which in my opinion is a masterpiece, the archery range buildings for the 1992 Summer Olympic Games in Barcelona, and the La, Lu La Laguna School in da Badalona. The work of Pinos Miraes received awards on several occasions, including the FAD Prize for the Launa School and the Igualada Cemetery Park, as well the City of Barcelona Prize for the 1992 Olympic Archery Range uh, buildings. Uh, and we are going to see all these works. In uh, 1991, Pinot set up her own studio and transferred the supervision and construction uh, uh, of several projects initiated in her previous office together with Eric Mirais. Amongst them was the community center and auditorium in Hostalet, the, the Balania, the Lamina community center and the boarding school in Morella. Since then, she has combined her activity as an architect with teaching, working as a guest professor, among, amongst others, at the University of Illinois at Ur Urbana-Champaign uh, in uh, the United States, the Kunst Academy in Dusseldorf, and Columbia University in New York, 1999. The Ecole Polytechnique Federale de Lausanne, 2001-2002, and the school she graduated from in Barcelona the University de l'Estudi de Inera, anyway, and the Harvard University Graduate School 2003, and in Switzerland at Mendrisio. So a very, very rich uh, teaching activity. Notable projects during her career include the pedestrian bridge in Petrer, Alicante, the Juan Aparicio waterfront in Torre Vieja, uh, the La Serra High School in Molerusa, the Sescad, it's a long uh, list, uh, Espana Square in Palma del Mallorca, the Cube Tower, actually two Cube Towers in Guadalajara, and we are going to see them, the primary school in uh, well, that place in Barcelona. More recent projects include the Novoli Housing Complex in Florence, the Catalan Government Headquarters in Tordosa, a high school in San Carlos de la Rapita and an office building in Igualada. Pinos designed the Gardunia Square in Barcelona, as well as two adjacent buildings, a housing building and the Masana Fine, Fine Art School. Pinos' work has been exhibited at several galleries, museums and universities, including the, the Kunstakademie in Stuttgart, the, this architecture Hochschule in um, high school in Aachen, in the University of Illinois Urba, Urbana Champaign, uh, Eight Plan Gallery in New York, anyway, Contemporary Art Museum Puerto Rico, the found the Coam Foundation of Madrid, Colleges of Architects Valencia, Galicia, the Spanish Pavilion in the Venice Architecture Biennial since 2006, the model of the Cube Tower. Again, there are two Cube Towers is part of the permanent collection of the Museum of Modern Art in New York. So as you can see, a very, very rich activity, a total dedication to the art of architecture. This is Carmen Pinos, uh, and uh, this is her website, 
you can uh, you can find out more about her and her works from from this um, website. It's very easy to memorize. Cp no, cpinos carmepinos dot com. And um, bravo to her. You know something happened. Something changed in the world. In the past, more or less remote. You know, the wife was just the wife of someone either famous or not famous, but things changed. So, Carme Pino, she was married to a famous architect, Eric Miraes. He died young, unfortunately, I think at 45. And, um, uh, but before he died, um, he, they, they got separated and he married another famous architect, Benedetta Taliabue. What is remarkable is that these two, uh, architects, uh, Carmen Pinos and Benedetta Taliabue, not only that they didn't collapse after the death of their husband, but they actually prospered. They became better. And, and, uh, and, 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 and their works, uh, brilliant at times, uh, testify to the fact that there is a lot of creativity in women architects. It's not any longer that patriarchy where, where only the men counted in the field of creativity, not at all. So, and this, this shows clearly after the death of Enric Miraes, Carme Pinos developed her own uh, uh, practice uh, beautifully and so did his second wife, Benedetta Taliabue, about whom we'll talk actually tomorrow. So, Carme Pinos, bravo to her. Uh, this is a building we are going to see in detail that she built uh, a little later. This is one of the two cubes that he, she built in, 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 in Mexico City. Uh, again, back to the, this uh, Caixa Forum. Uh, I don't have uh, this presentation needs a little bit of more strict organization, but we are going to see some of her most important works. She also designed, uh, you know, uh, objects, if you are to call shelving system, an object. Um, often her works um, uh, employ uh, uh, conceptual vignettes with which she uh, describes the, you know, the, the, the essential thought besides, besides um, a project she built. Here she is in her office uh, after she separated from Eric Miraes, but here she is with Eric Miraes. As I said, he died young uh, and uh, Igualada Cemetery, which in my opinion is a masterpiece, in my opinion has the same quality and significance for architecture as the Brion Cemetery by Carlos Carpa. Uh, he did it, she did it together with Enric Miraes, they worked together. And uh, let's read a little bit about it as part of a competition to replace an older cemetery. Enric Miraes and Carme Pinos envisioned a new type of cemetery that began to consider those that were laid to rest, as well as the families that still remained. After 10 years of construction, the Igualada Cemetery outside the Barcelona, Catalonia, Spain, was completed in 1994 as a place of reflection and memories. And this is, it. Uh, again, uh, it's, it's, it's very important what is written here, that this was a place conceived to be just not just for those laid to rest, that is not just for the dead, but also for the living. And the relationship between them being, being uh, addressed uh, creatively. It's an unusual cemetery, but anything that is very creative is unusual and it has to be unusual, otherwise uh, we'll not talk about it. So the Igualada Cemetery is a project that challenges the traditional notions of what makes a cemetery. Miraes and Pinos conceptualized the poetic ideas of a cemetery for the visitors to begin to understand and accept the cycle of life as a link between the past, the present, and the future. It's understood by the architects to be a city of the dead, where the dead and the living are brought closer together in spirit. As much as the Igualada Cemetery is a place for those to be laid to rest, it is also a place for those to come and reflect in the solitude and serenity of the Catalonian landscape. 
it's done i i would say or we would, could say with modest means it's not a you know an opulent cemetery which would be almost a nonsense uh, although, of course, many people, uh, you know, think that we we can only honor the, the dead through the imposing mausoleums covered in marble and so on. But I think um, uh, a more uh, discreet or more spiritual way of reflecting on death would be conducive to... to, to uh, create a, a cemetery which is... Um, the, uh, poetical, uh, uh, it doesn't emphasize uh, the illusion that, you know, through marble and uh, huge mausoleums, we can actually achieve eternity. Uh, look at the plan of the cemetery, which is like almost like a human silhouette. I don't know if they did, did it intentionally, but uh, uh, it's possible that um, the thought didn't escape, uh, didn't escape them. Do we know what death is? No, and nor do we know what life is. But but it's all the more important to 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 reflect on 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 the end of life. And I, it is my 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 thought and my feeling that actually, if we do not consider death seriously. We are so symmetrically and, uh, and almost as a consequence, we do not um, uh, honor life as it should be honored. Because I think life and death, they are like the two cups of a clepsydra, of an hourglass. Life nourishes death, and death in turn, through memories, nourishes life. They are uh, intertwined, life and death. I love, I love very much what, um, what, what I look at here. You know this detail of this uh, uh, of this cemetery created by uh, Carmen Pinos and uh, uh, Eric Miraes. Again, done with a very simple means, but uh, artistically very valid and potent. And and yes, they 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 show that seriousness without which designing a a, a cemetery is not uh, is not acceptable, actually. Melancholia is unavoidable. Sadness is unavoidable. But but the the, the quality of the work, I think, uh, transcends even uh, uh, despair, because it was said that art transgresses uh, death. Maybe this itself is an illusion, but it is important this illusion. And without art, I think life would be uh, much more difficult. But art doesn't mean to, to mimic uh, inauthentic things. It, it is really about truth, paradox, paradoxically as it may sound. I think actually um, uh, um, art uh, has to tell the truth, even in a form which could uh, scandalize people or make them uh, puzzled or make them uh, unaccepted. Now, La Villa Olimpica, the Olympic uh, city, that they built in 1992. They did some remarkable works here for the Olympics in 1992. And, and they were still young architects, uh, both of them. The pergolas of the, uh, of the avenue Icaria, and I always ask myself, why did they design wow, it? Oh, I Oana. Pardon? Sorry, 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 I'm sorry. No, do you want to say something? No, I've just entered. And uh, I had my microphone okay, on, so sorry. If you want to say something, please do so. Otherwise, please be kind and turn off the microphone. So, you know, but again, if you want to say something, please do so. So these pergolas that um, uh, Eric Miraes and uh, Carme Pinos designed are very, very intriguing. And I asked myself, why did they build them this way? And I, I found out uh, that actually, I. I neglected the fact that they are placed on this avenue, Icaria, which probably the name comes from, I don't know Catalan, but it's probably connected with Icarus, because wings melted because he approached the sun too closely. And it's possible that, um, I, I actually think there is a relationship between the architectonic quality 
and the expression of these pergolas and uh, the, the fact that this avenue is called Icaria. And here it is. They do look like broken wings. And you say, my God, my God, you know, that's not what one should do, you know, by the way of Olympics, because this was done in conjunction with the, the activities that took place in the Olympics uh, that took place in, uh, in Barcelona. I, I like very much as uh, artistic works, as cultural works, as uh, unconventional uh, pergolas, uh, these, these works, but they, they do have a symbolic meaning. And uh, I think that symbolic meaning is connected with the name of the street or the avenue they are situated on. Now, this is indeed, this is what they were doing at that time. You know, it's, uh, of course, the conventional architect and the conventional designer and the conventional critic and the conventional uh, public would, uh, uh, would be um, turned off to express myself non-academically uh, uh, working uh, underneath these pergolas. But I love them because they represent the tension in the human soul. They represent the aspiration as Icarus himself had to approach the sun. Okay, the wings melted down, but but the but there is there was no ability though, even though maybe with some foolishness, of aspiring towards the sun. So these pergolas do not leave you indifferent. Who designed such pergolas ever before? Nobody. They did it. Carmen Pinos and Eric Miraes, and bravo to them, because I think we do need the provocation of art. We do need sculpture. We do need things that do not uh, reduce themselves to the placid function of, uh, I don't know, uh, serving, I don't know what purpose. I, I totally agree with the saying, epate la bourgeoisie. Let's shock the bourgeois within ourselves as well, because we are too comfortable with the idea that life uh, is just about sitting comfortably on a comfortable sofa. No, I, I don't think that's why we were born for. So these pergolas have an existential uh, uh, meaning and uh, message almost, you know. Uh, they, they are exceptional works. And I'm very happy that the city of Barcelona built them, unconventional as they are. And they did so uh, before the arrival of uh, Its Majesty the computer in our lives. It was 1994. Um, at that time, uh, you know, the digital techniques were not uh, developed at all. I mean, for personal use. There is melancholia here, I would say. And, and yes, maybe some sport tips would, would, would have been, uh, I mean, you cannot compete in, uh, in, an, in Olympics uh, from the positions of melancholia. I would understand. But on the other hand, the creativity of the work itself is an encouragement to, to fight, to, to fight what you, for what you believe in. The pedestrian footbridge in Petrer, Alicante, 1991-1999, this was done, and were, or at least was finalized by Carmen Pinos without Enric Miraes. But you see, even here, you know, the disruption of, uh, of uh, you know, look at, look at, look at this so-called detail, you know, why, why was this done? Well, it's maybe a reminder of, uh, of, uh, of the fact that uh, life uh, sooner or later uh, does end in a, in, a, in, a, in in you know in, in its opposite in a way uh, so conflict uh, and fragmentation uh, disruption they they are do they do exist within life itself maybe you say well uh, the function of a bridge is not to remind us of death or of illness or of uh, sadness or whatever but uh, on the other hand why not Because, because crossing a bridge, you know, it's a threshold. It's a, it's a motion, moment of tension. Now you, 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 you walk over an abyss, bigger or smaller, 
and it's a, it's a, it's crossing the threshold. It's a moment moment of tension. It's a moment of of, of conflict even. You leave one stage behind and you assume another stage. If, if you are so kind, I still hear some noises. Please turn off the microphone unless you want to say something. The vignettes that I said that Carmen Pinos always employs to show the, the you know, the formal and conceptual essence of a, of a project that here we see, uh, you know, uh, details of of, uh, of, uh, of the work for, for for the archery. I don't know if I show here the, the archery. Uh, I should. The Juan Aparicio Seafront in Tora, this is another work done by Carme Pinos, and I think done by her without Eric Miraes. I should have had more clearly um, segregated the two periods in her creativity, one with uh, Eric Miraes and the second by herself. Here she is, um, Carmen Pinos, to open the Butler School of Architecture summer show. And I would ask the students here, when do you want to have a summer show with your own works, your very creative work? Let's do one this summer. Are you ready? I am, I am putting at your disposal a space where you can do it. We'll talk about it at the end of the presentation. Please remember my challenge. Let's do an exhibition with your very creative works, if you think they deserve to be seen. Why can't we have such an atmosphere here as well? Of course, this is a famous school, and uh, but she opened, you understand, Carme Pinos was... Uh, was invited to open the Butler School of Architecture summer show. And here it is. I, we don't see her here, but we see the students and the faculty and so on. The master plan for the historic center of Saint-Dizier in France, uh, but no pictures. The department building the, of the new campus of the Vienna University of Economics and Business was not built. No, no, this was built and is actually built uh, very near, in fact, is the neighbor of a library built by Zaha Hadid. And we are going to see uh, this fact that I just uh, mentioned. So she built this in Vienna. She did another project for Vienna, which was not built, but this one was built. And I visited with a number of students and I think is not inferior this building to um, uh, the building by Zaha Hadid, which is uh, on the right. I hope I have, yeah, here it is. This building is by Zaha Hadid, and this building is by Carmen Pinos. And across the, the space is uh, uh, a building by another important architect, uh, Peter Cook. So here is uh, Zaha, and here is Carmen Pinos. Very different, the architecture of these two uh, ladies. Yes, here you see Zaha Hadid, Carmen Pinos, and uh, Mr. Cook. Peter Cook. Now, Cube One Tower in Guadalajara, Mexico. She built two towers, and we are going to see both. In Guadalajara, they have a remarkable uh, contemporary architecture because they uh, are ambitious and uh, they have cultural, uh, uh, you know, uh, longings for uh, significance. So they invited important architects to build the Carmen Pinos is one of them. I like the fact that she tried to filter the light through this additional, um, you know, this, I don't know how to call it, this second facade done here with wood, you know, is, 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 is about filtering light and, and creating some kind of a mask or a second uh, facade, which she also employed in Vienna in that building that we just saw. Yes, a lot of concrete and concrete pollutes at that time when she built it, 
maybe there wasn't so much concern with concrete, but today we should be very careful. I like this fact that, you know, here you have this, uh, the center of the building is actually an excavation of the monolith, which otherwise the building would have been. I hope I have the plan a little bit uh, later here so I can explain or I can describe what I try to uh, what I try to describe. But when you combine concrete with wood or concrete with brick, I think the even uh, in terms of uh, aesthetics uh, is better than maybe Tadawando would disagree, but Tadawando, I don't know if you know, and I mentioned this some other times, he doesn't live in a concrete house. He lived in a wooden house. Yes, Tadao Ando, the master of uh, concrete, is actually living in a wood house, in a wooden house, not in a concrete house. In the house he, uh, his parents uh, you know, had and now is his. Anyway, but here we see wood and concrete, wood and concrete, and I think the, the, the wood warms up concrete. And I think uh, Louis Kahn uh, was quite aware of this because he also employed uh, in some important occasions concrete and, um, and wood. Like for example, in the Yale Art Gallery, um, um, a British Art Museum at Yale University. I'm talking about uh, Louis Kahn. This is the plan of, the, of this cube one that Carmen Pinos built in Guadalajara. And this is the empty space, you know, between the uh, the core of, of the building. And again, it's a building which uh, which uh, is uh, sculptural, is uh, uh, dramatic, even is uh, is the sum of uh, uh, opposite forces. There is, uh, um, uh, you know, the concave and the convex. Even in the case of non curves, curves, but but uh, you can even talk about concavity and uh, you know and, and the concave and the convex, even if you don't have necessarily explicit curves. It's a good building that she built, and uh, again, it shows the potential of a sculptural uh, office tower, which assume, uh, assumes risks, is not afraid of cantilevered parts. Is not afraid of, well, it's true, the climate there in Guadalajara is warm. So, you know, um, the losses of energy that you might have in a cold climate, uh, uh, they don't have there. But on the other hand, since winter is almost disappearing, uh, at least in this part of Europe, maybe this concern should be a little bit uh, uh, less stringent. The Cuban tower in uh, Guadalajara, this is the vignette employed by her to illustrate the, the essence, uh, formal and conceptual of the project. And then we are going to see the second tower she built, the cube two tower. This one rather inappropriately called cube because it's not a cube, but maybe, you know, there is like a, they, are, they are relatives, the two buildings. Very different this one from the, so let's look at the vignette of this, of cube one, which is this one. And then cube two, but you can tell is the same architect, although the plans seem to differ significantly. Uh, an elevation, and here it is. Not bad. In fact, there are other skyscrapers around this one, but I think hers is the best. You see here again the potential of a veiled architecture because there are there are two facades in a way you know the one behind this uh, you know uh, uh, maze of horizontal lines and this veiling of the facade I think has uh, uh, virtues in other kind of climates not just in, in the Mexican uh, uh, context it creates an ambiguity but also it uh, it uh, uh, it uh, models light in, in, in more poetical terms, which I think is important. The, the building on the left was not built by her. She built the one on the right. 
uh, again, I think hers is best from these tall buildings. This is Carme Pinos right here. Guadalajara, Mexico. These systems of uh, Brissolé, I think uh, uh, they have virtues functionally, but also aesthetically. Now, the University of Economics and Business in Vienna, this is the project that was not built as yet, as far as I know. Now, the restoration of the back facade of this market in Barcelona, 2007-2015, Benedetta Taliabue also built, a, um, maybe she started the project with Eric Miraes, uh, a market, but this is done by Carme Pinos. Not bad. It is. It has the drama of the sloping uh, roof, and uh, you know it is cultural. It is vigorous. It is engaging, expressing the dynamics of a market, because a market is a gathering place with uh, uh, some drama. Even sometimes, if you don't negotiate properly with the seller. Anyway, Carme Pinos, Barcelona. Yeah, she is a proud lady who achieved something in this life and she, she will continue to achieve. Here she is with her uh, former husband, uh, Eric Miraes. They are very young here. Maybe they just uh, finished school or so. Here she is uh, with some furniture, you know, that, that she created. Uh, the, now the Cube to, uh, 2 office tower in Zapopan, Mexico, we already saw some pictures with it. Now we see others. Again, only this tower is hers. This one is not. You know, diagonal, slanted surfaces, they do create a sense of becoming, a sense of um, instability even, but that sense of instability is necessary in a dynamic world to express the, you know, the, the many forces that are uh, uh, in a complex interplay in our life today. So I would say diagonals and, uh, you know, uh, deviations from... Uh, strict re rectangularity could have in uh, in a skillful hands a uh, beneficial effect these are the plans of this um, of this tower called cube 2 although it's not a cube She built it by uh, herself without, uh, at that time, when she built these two towers, she worked alone without any mirages. We see here again the, the power of diagonals, the engaging dynamic qualities that diagonals uh, bring to, to the work. And the structures you can see in the plan as well is itself engaging. Here it is uh, at the beginning of the construction process, an initial sketch for the cube one, not cube two. Here is again cube two in the context of those towers. Now a single family house in the district of Valcarca in Barcelona, 2003-2010. 
an excellent uh, modern uh, house built in a, uh, on a street, as you can see, with valuable older buildings. But we have harmony through contrast. And here is again the vignette that illustrates the, you know, the conceptualization of the project. I like the fact that although it is a house, it doesn't look like a house. So, you know, uh, the, the hiding of, of the domestic aspects of the house is, I think, a, a good thing. It's a house which doesn't look like a house. Inside, though, yes, it does. And the furniture that she designed. Now, the Caixa Forum, we already saw a picture of it. Uh, Zaragoza Arquitectura España Caixa Forum. Um, here it is. Sculptural itself. While architecture is not an inhabited or inhabitable sculpture, it does benefit from sculpturalness. Maybe there are uh, some echoes here from uh, Marcel Breuer, the uh, the Whitney American, uh, the Whitney Museum of American Art. And if you compare this building by Carmen Pinos with this building, I don't know who designed it. In my opinion, here we see life and here we see less. Of course, there were great buildings done, you know, symmetrically and only with right angles and so on. But this one is just too placid and too static for our, for our time, in my opinion. Well, this building expresses better the time we live in. Even more so when the, when the technologies of the present are allowed to manifest themselves. The Caixa Forum, we know that the uh, Caixa Forum was built also by Herzog and de Moron. So why not use projections or a system of uh, you know changing the facades of the building uh, using the technologies that we have. Yes, it's true. We consume uh, electrical uh, energy, but electricity. But uh, you know, if you assume the consequences of building, then uh, the scene was already committed, so to speak. This is a summer house she designed in Guadalajara, in Mexico. It's a little house. But she combines, as you can see, stonework with the um, sleek uh, uh, aesthetics of um, newer material, so to speak. It's a house which is domestic, but itself has, you know, uh, a lot of uh, uh, the cross ventilation is uh, one aspect of the building that derives from uh, uh, transparencies on, on two opposite uh, elevations and also uh, to opposite views. Uh, the house is very open. It's very open uh, on various sides, so there is a dynamic uh, quality here at work as well. What would you do without a telescope, right? We need to inspect the stars, the distant stars. The, the house is not very spectacular, but, uh, you know, not everything has to be spectacular. It's probably a pleasant house to be in. And the plan, as we can see, is uh, playful. And why shouldn't it be? You can tell in this project as well that Carmen Pinos uh, uh, enjoys, uh, you know, playing with the opposites, with uh, contradiction even, with tension, with conflict. There is conflict within this building as there is conflict in some other buildings that she built. 
Now, the Catalan government headquarters in Tortosa in Spain, uh, I like this building very much because you see the existing buildings, obviously not in a you know very uh, rich area of the city, but the building stands out with the dignity of a healthy modernity in a context uh, that, uh, you know, for someone less creative, would have meant uh, uh, something very different. And 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 uh, we see again the virtues of harmony through contrast, because obviously the building that she built has nothing in common with the buildings that that surround it. But that is fine. That's why I say it's harmony through contrast. Why should a governmental building be, you know, oppressively authoritarian and uh, without um, sculptural playfulness and without uh, even at times uh, uh, outrageous uh, creativity, like in the case of uh, the parliament building in uh, Edinburgh uh, that uh, Eric Miraes and uh, Benedetta Taliabue built. But she finalized the work because uh, Eric Miraes died. A uh, very unconventional work for, uh, you know, the governmental services, uh, services of, at the highest level of, uh, of Edinburgh. But here we are now in this city in, in, in Spain with a building built by um, Carmen Pinos. And again, what does this building have in common with, with this one or that one or this one? Maybe what they have in common is that they, they were all true of their time and their place. This building was built recently, so it had to be built from a different premise, conceptual and otherwise. And that's exactly what she did. As um, um, Maria Olbrich uh, inscribed on the elevation of the secessionist movement in um, uh, the secessionist building in uh, the headquarters of the secessionist movement in um, Vienna, in Austria, to each time it's art and to art it's freedom. And that's exactly what Carmen Pinoz did with this building. Look at the windows here and look at the windows here. This is a different time. So she built according to her time to the time she built. But the building is not uh, outrageous in any way. It's just that it has a dynamic quality that uh, the buildings around this uh, doesn't, don't have. Not so much in plan, perhaps, as you can see. A governmental building. But I would reiterate, she expresses conflict, tension, the dynamic qualities of a, of a lived life, if I can say so. Design, and with this we'll end this uh, short presentation on Carmen Pinos. Let's, uh, let's uh, look at some of her designs, meaning, uh, you know, uh, design of objects, of furniture, a bench. And you can see other works as, as well on, on her website. This is for the Caixa Forum that we saw, uh, Re Restore on Table. This one as, as well for Caixa Forum. Often, very often, architects design not only buildings, but they design also, you know, furnishings and so on. Uh, some even design, uh, you know, tapestries or, uh, you know, uh, even the slippers of the, uh, you know, the, the client, if we had to recall the case of Joseph Hoffman. Architects, when they are ambitious, they want to design everything. Maybe this is obsessive and probably is. Anyway. Because a good architect is a good designer and an architect could do urbanism, could do... We read that, that she studied urbanism after she finished her architecture studies. 
but urbanism is also architecture. So, you know, there is no contradiction here. Uh, good architect designs a table, designs a city, designs a building, sometimes better, sometimes less, but the attempt is there. So let's uh, let's have a talk if you want a little bit. <laughs>